Hi, I'm Bryce Hancock. I'm the executive director of Mile High Sober Living in Denver, Colorado. We are making this film to raise awareness about uh, recovery from addiction, to educate about the business of sober housing, and to shine a spotlight on the amazing recovery community here in Denver, Colorado. Everybody has a story about addiction. I have a story about addiction too. Uh, in this film, you're gonna hear many stories of addiction, and you're also gonna hear many stories of recovery. So I was about two years sober and I was depressed. I was, I had this toxic codependent relationship that had ended, which I wanted back. I was living in the mountains in a big house. It really, really wasn't my dream house. I had this job, which was a good job, but it wasn't my passion and I was depressed. And I was sober and I had never been depressed sober. So I started, I started talking to some people. I started, I wanted to give back. I wanted to give back um, to recovery. I remember being at a Music Hairs recovery meeting, um, which, is an, which is an organization that helps meetings, and a therapist named Marty Ryan told me that we need, we need sober houses. Uh, the recovery community desperately needs sober houses. The truth is that I didn't really even know what a sober house was. Um, at the time, I had a, a best friend named Andrew Wainwright, who is in the recovery industry up in St. Paul, Minnesota. He has, he has a friend named Chris Edrington who owns St. Paul Sober Living up in St. Paul, Minnesota. He, he educated me on how he does it, the philosophy, um, what it's all about, and I started looking for houses here in Denver, Colorado. So in 2016, I bought a beautiful house in Congress Park in Denver, Colorado and opened my first sober house. Um, guys come out of treatment and they, um, they learn the behaviors that's gonna get them to um, long-term recovery. My name is Michael Hornbuckle. I'm currently the manager here at Mile High Sober Living in Congress Park in Denver, Colorado, president of the Hornbuckle Foundation and a musician. I think that the biggest goal and the biggest hope for guys when they come in is that, um, first of all, if they commit as much time as they can here to give themselves the best possible chance for when they get out. And while they're here, to bust their butt at recovery i.e. community-based fellowship meetings, um, whatever, whatever is required of you to do there, 12 steps. Um, you can see it. You can see it on paper that the guys that do it generally obtain some longevity and recovery, and the guys that don't generally go the exact opposite way back to where they were, and a lot of the times die. You know, that's, so we have a lot of fun, but we also, remember how serious this is what we're doing. It's supposed to kill us. What we're dealing with is supposed to kill us. So the fact that we recover is, is um, and we do recover is, is miraculous. I have a long track record of trying to maintain recovery for about two decades. For the longest time I knew I needed help, but I wanted it to be easy. So I did a tour of treatments all across the country and down in New Mexico even, from the best treatments to the worst treatments, and um, in hopes that 30, 60, 90 days would, would fix me. It had to be, become, as they say, the last house on the block for me. I had to exhaust all other options. Um, I really wish there was a cure out there for people like me, but they're not. There isn't, and um, being involved in sober living and, and, and living around a group of guys who all have one primary focus and allowing that to help me build a new fellowship and, um, in my life has become um, invaluable. I'm Sherry, I'm with Sobriety First Sober Living in Aurora, Colorado. So we have 10 houses located in Aurora, um, five male, five female. Um, the requirements for our program is you have to come in with a clean UA. Um, we have initial move-in fees. Uh, most importantly for our program, you have to be willing to work a 12-step program. We do a lot of service. We go up to different treatment centers and volunteer and do presentations on sober living. What's that about? Because um, that's a scary step to get out of a treatment center and not know what's next and maybe your family won't let you come home. Um, and so we can welcome them here and get them transitioned into a healthy lifestyle. I graduated from Raleigh House. Um, and then I left Raleigh House and I went to another program in Bowling Green, Kentucky uh, called The Bridge to Recovery. And I left there, or while I was there, I wasn't sure where I was going to come back to. You know, I wasn't sure if I was going to come back and live with my grandparents. I was going to go into a sober living. I was going to go back home because that was like the God forbid option. Um, 
and and I came back and you know my my the the counselor that I had when I was in rehab uh, knew about you guys through Tomas Hernandez and um, and she she suggested you to us uh, and so my mom made the phone call a couple days before I I came back from Kentucky um, and she she asked you know if we you know she kind of asked some questions and got a little bit of information and and I was I was really worried about coming to sober living um, because of certain horror stories that I'd heard from you know people whether it's in the rooms of the 12-step programs or it was the people um, from rehab but I came and I visited uh, the day after I got back from from Kentucky and uh, all of my fears were dashed you know Bryce and and Michael who was the house manager are, are just so authentic and so 12-step oriented so so recovery oriented that that any fears that I had um, were just just destroyed I, I, I didn't I wasn't afraid of sober living anymore in fact I, I became very excited for it because I knew that this was going to be a place that I could flourish 37 years old I walked into my dad's uh, front door this man you're talking about a man that's uh, worked the fields of Colorado one of 14 kids you know they didn't have a lot of stuff for 14 kids what can you do borrow each other's shirts you know what I mean uh, Tough, tough, tough man, hard, hard hands, hands of stone, uh, hard worker, mechanical engineer. Um, 70 something years old, I've never seen a tear until that day. And he goes, this is the legacy that you're gonna leave me. He goes, a washed up, junky, violent, ex-con, drunken punk. He goes, I don't even wanna look at you right now, go upstairs. So that's always stuck with me. You know, how, how do I, how do I change my own lineage of being that at 37 years old? Who can I just ask to help me to do that? In popular culture today, the way we understand fixing alcoholism or addiction uh, is we send people to treatment. That seems to be the easy, immediate solution. So everyone calls and says, my name's so-and-so, this is the emergency, this is what just happened, and we need to get my son to treatment. I'm like, okay, I understand that that's what you want to have happen. You think that that's the appropriate solution for the problem that you have. So from where I sit and my understanding of the continuum of care, and when I say the continuum of care what I mean is how we get well, how we proceed towards remission from this illness. Um, so when you call me, I hear that you're struggling and you're in crisis and you want to get this fixed immediately and you want to get your son to treatment. You think if I do this, if I move my son from this hospital to this treatment center, he will effectively get well. What I know is that if you do that, he has a 25% chance of recovering, of effectively attaining remission, of, we'll call it, staying sober for a year post-discharge, which is an easy metric for folks to understand. My name is Stephanie King, and I work for the Shores Treatment and Recovery Center in Port St. Lucie, Florida. And I am extremely passionate when it comes to the awful disease of addiction um, because I was married to an alcoholic who is terminally sick from his addiction. And he was the nicest man you would have ever met. He would have given anybody the shirt off his back. He took my friends in when they had nowhere to go. He paid for my twin sister's college education. He would have done anything for anyone. He's just sick from his addiction to alcohol. The bottom line is, is that addiction needs to be treated and viewed as the brain disease that it is. It is a brain disease. It doesn't mean you have any sort of moral deficiency. I send pro athletes, I send teachers, I send stay at home moms, you name it, I've sent them to treatment. And it doesn't discriminate. And the stigma is the reason why, part of the reason why all of these Americans are overdosing daily. Yeah, so I've been sober for about six months and uh, I feel really blessed to be here, but sobriety has its own challenges that are gonna follow you wherever you go. Uh, so I came out to Denver to go to rehab, and I chose Denver not because it was Denver, but because the rehab I wanted to go to was out here. It seemed like they offered the most, uh, most progressive and thorough treatment. So I came out here and I did that for a 90-day program, and uh, then I decided that I needed sober living, which was a tough decision. As a drug addict, I wanted to live alone immediately after rehab, which looking back on it now is obviously a poor idea. And uh, looking at sober livings was also kind of tough for me because 
for one thing, I'm on Suboxone, and most sober livings don't take people who are on Suboxone. So that narrowed numbers down pretty significantly, and I also hear a lot of horror stories about sober livings that don't have any sort of management and direction by the people who own it and the people who are running it. And I was very surprised and pleased coming here that I did find that because otherwise I felt like I was just walking into a bad situation where I was gonna have to put up with people using and that wouldn't work for me. So I'm really glad I got to this to this point and where I'm at. What I see now for people that are that are just starting recovery they have choices. They have, um, they've got experts now that are trained in trauma. You know, back when I got uh, clean and sober, trauma was not in the forefront of, of the healing modalities around, you know, there weren't clinicians that were really looking for that in somebody's history. Brain chemistry, you know, just brain, how the brain works, we know so much more now than we did. Addiction is a chronic progressive fatal disease. That means it doesn't go away, it only gets worse, and it eventually will kill you. In fact, it almost killed me. When I left home at age 18, I became a daily blackout drinker. After college, when most people were starting jobs and starting families, I moved to Baltimore and became addicted to heroin and crack. Fortunately for me, I wanted to be a musician, and um, as such, I was, I was able to dial my drug use back and um, just drink for the most part. I was able to play everywhere from CBGB's in New York City to the Eating Factory in LA. I even got to play Red Rocks. 20 years ago, I moved to Colorado, and for the next 10 years, I was, I was doing pretty good as long as I managed to keep my drug use to a minimum and just drink. 10 years ago, however, I was um, given the opportunity to buy a music club. And from there, my alcoholism took a downward spiral. It just, just ruined my life. The doctor did a blood test, and um, my liver enzymes were elevated. He came back and he said, um, he said, you're a late stage alcoholic. He said, I give you one to two years to live if you can't stop drinking. I couldn't stop drinking. I kept drinking for over a year. Um, I had lost the power of choice and I just couldn't stop. One night after hours at the club, I, um, I had a breakdown. I, uh, I remember pacing back and forth, I was drinking. I remember being in my office, which was also the liquor closet surrounded by liquor. And um, I called a friend who I knew had guns and I asked him if I could have a gun. I remember sitting in a waiting room looking at a poster with the benefits of electroshock therapy and I remember thinking, you know, this really is about it because I'm crazy. When I got out of the hospital, I immediately went to an AA meeting and asked for help. I remember talking to somebody and saying, I don't think this is going to work. I don't think I'm going to make it. And he said, you don't have to. You don't have to believe it's going to work. You just need to do what people tell you. And so I went to outpatient rehab and I went to a lot of meetings and, um, you know, I got sober. I learned how to be a father. I learned how to be a son, I learned how to be a productive member of society, and you know, there I was in beautiful Denver, Colorado. The inspiration from one guy just begets it to the next guy, and that's been huge in my life. I had to know that I could still play music, that I could still go places that I didn't used to be able to go and, and uh, maintain any so, sense of um, sanity. So people think that treatment's the way to go, that uh, if we send someone there that they're going to get fixed, all that's really going to happen is they're going to get assessed, detoxed, and stabilized. The problem is that folks will go to detox, they'll get out 48, 72 hours later, and they say they feel much better. They do feel much better, but their chances of long-term abstinence of being in recovery are very, very slim. The really key piece here is about moving them back into community, about reintegrating them to life, because there's so much stigma and shame associated with having this particular illness, and there's so much stigma culturally that comes with recovering from this illness that overcoming that is a process. It doesn't happen in 10 days, it doesn't happen in 28 days, and the more tools you can give individuals to repatriate, to uh, join a community, to meet other people that are doing the same things they are, to give them the opportunity to recover um, amidst fellowship and support over the longest period of time, that's the single most important factor to generate great long-term outcomes. I recently had a client that reached out to me for help and um, before I sent her to treatment I had to send her to the ER because she had broken a dirty hair with needle in her arm. And because she did not want to be judged, I asked her, I said, why didn't you go to the emergency room? Why have you suffered with this broken needle in your arm for two weeks? And she said, because she didn't want them to judge her. 
and I and I told her, I said, you need to make sure they know you have a plan. You're going directly to treatment when they release you from the emergency room. But because she didn't go right away, like she should have because she was scared of being judged, the uh, infection from the broken needle in her arm led to her bloodstream and caused all kinds of different medical issues. When we're talking about sober living, the biggest challenge is that it's not codified in the payment system. So. Um, the uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services puts together most of the codes today. They write the codes for what the healthcare system will pay for, so it moves over to the private side. So if you have, you know, it doesn't matter, whatever kind of insurance that you have, the card in your wallet, you'll say, what can I get for my son? And they'll say, you can get this, this, and this. Today, there isn't a code for uh, sober living. Right? That level of care isn't paid for. 20 years ago, we used to have uh, halfway houses, and that was a big thing for, for the 30 years that preceded that, and a lot of times that was paid for, that was codified. Um, and there was a billable code for halfway housing because it was a clinical level of care. As managed care moved forward and we begin to try and man manage care basically meaning that we're trying to contain costs. Part of the ways that we contain costs is that we limited lengths of stay and we stopped paying for things that didn't have proven outcomes. So a lot of times if it wasn't a clinical level of care, they wouldn't reimburse for it. Sober living fits that niche exactly. The problem, however, here is that sober living is the most efficacious tool that we have in the continuum of care today. And the heartbreaker is that the healthcare system hasn't caught up yet to find a way to pay for it. This sober house is, uh, it's the basics. And I got this mantra of, of this recovery of keeping it simple, and it's, I've gotten some mileage out of it. The first experience I had in Los Angeles uh, managing a house out there was real trial and error and I got thrown into it. Here it's, um, the basics are stressed and um, there's not a whole lot of watered down any rocket science type stuff. It's just like, if you do what's worked for us and so many people, I can almost guarantee you, whoever I'm talking to, that um, you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy recovery. They gotta understand that uh, living a life in sobriety, um, you know, they, they get to do the things that they weren't able to do in their addiction. And, um, you know, they have the fellowship and the friends in their houses if they're having a bad day or a good day to do that with. The father comes to me with X amount of money. He needs to private pay for his son. And if the budget's $30,000, he could say, I need to go to this treatment center. I heard they have great things happening there that people get well there. I'm gonna say that that's true, but I don't wanna spend your entire budget on that. I think it's important that we can use uh, a part of the money to get your son detox assessed and stabilized. So we'll do that at the local hospital for three to five days. And then either when the benefit runs out or for private paying, it's gonna cost us, let's say $5,000. We're gonna take the rest of that money, we're gonna spread it out across the rest of that year. We're gonna try and buy him the longest period of time we can for his body and his mind to recover. So if I'm spending money inside of the system today, I'm gonna to spend my money on sober living. Because as I said before, out of all the tools available to me in the healthcare continuum today, hands down, sober living is the most cost-effective, efficacious tool that I have, that I can put in use, that absolutely positively generates the best long-term outcomes. There's no doubt about that from the inside looking out. So I've witnessed a lot of success stories here at Mile High Sober Living. Um, you know, it's tough. Some of us, they, we come in, some of the guys come in, they get on board with a the program, they, they support each other with, um, you know, a sense of, of love and understanding, and they've created a house of recovery. And you know, for early sobriety, coming home to a house of recovery, a house full of recovery is the difference between life and death. Um, a lot of people will get out of treatment and go home. And that's where all their triggers are. That's where all their you know, drug addict friends might or might not be. And um, so they come here, they get on board, they work program, they help each other, and they learn how to live sober. I feel that I've been fortunate to learn in Colorado from a community of people that care about ethics. Um, not always is perfection. I'm not trying to give us a crown. But I know, I think that we work together very well. There's a lot of beautiful treatment centers out here that do a great job, great job. I'm becoming real proud of the recovery scene here in Denver. And I think that after experiencing out in Los Angeles, um, because it's really a huge community of recovery out there. And uh, 
there's a lot of fun stuff to do. And I think Denver um, um, specifically is like right on the cusp of sort of following suit. In, in the sense that as the population and the influx of people um, continues to grow here, so does the amount of creativity. And as we sort of keep, keep developing and finding our identity as a city, um, so will the recovery community follow. I could not be more excited for what the recovery community is doing this year. Um, as I was saying, we have so many people that have become passionate about giving back to this community here in Denver and Colorado, there's things going on around the state. For me, it was just three or four good friends in the beginning, and they changed my life forever. I hung on to them. They all had a little bit more recovery than I did, and I just hung on, and we had lots of time together, and we were going through, th through things together. And I look back on that, and that's what kept me hanging in there one day at a time. So. Denver's thriving, Colorado's thriving. We have a recovery community here that is art. There's art, there's film, there's creative energy everywhere. And we're trying to draw it out and bring these people music. We're trying to find everybody that has gifts and bring them all together to share their gifts and um, help, them, help them find a friend or two that'll support them on this journey so they don't have to do it alone. <laughs>